Thank you for being here today. Uh, we have a great program. This is one of the, uh, the best uh, panels we have. Uh, it's called the Film Panel, and uh, we have as a moderator uh, Lee Thomas, who is a four-time Emmy Award-winning uh, journalist, as well as a uh, best-selling author who's been featured Hello. on uh, CNN and Larry King and all of that. So this is going to be exciting. We have a nice... Uh, mix of uh, writers and directors and producers and we're going to highlight uh, the film industry in Michigan. Um, Lee? All right, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everybody who's in the audience and I love talking about movies because that's what I've been talking about for the last 30 years. So we have some filmmakers and newsmakers on stage. We're going to talk about movies. We're talking about movie opportunity here in Michigan. We're going to ignite and disrupt and change things when it comes to movies here. And we're going to hear from some very cool filmmakers with some products that are yet to come. Uh, a world premiere of a product that's going to happen here in just a little bit. But we have a lot to talk about. So let's start off with introducing Rola Neshev. She is a Lebanese American screenwriter. She's a director, producer, and multimedia artist born in Saban, Lebanon and raised in Michigan. She is noted for her award-winning film, Detroit Unleaded. Real quickly, talk, just talk about your inspiration. And when it comes to making a movie, you're a true entrepreneur because you, you really have to wear many hats. Talk about the hats you wore making Detroit Unleaded. Oh, sure. Uh, Detroit Unleaded started off with just an idea, obviously, like with how most films start off. And it grew into a short film that I re released in 2005. And the audience really wanted to see more of these characters. And so I got together with my family. I got together with uh, my my artist friends and everybody here from Michigan and, and Detroit and we fundraised uh, mm -hmm. a big enough budget to make it into a feature. Um, it was a very much an entrepreneurial effort because everything was really grassroots. You had yeah. to build everything from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And as a first time filmmaker too, you really are an entrepreneur because everything you're doing, yeah. you have to learn for the first time mm -hmm. and then execute. You're constantly learning and then executing. All right. um, so yeah, I never thought of myself as a businesswoman <laughs> until <laughs> I made yeah. a film, honestly. I right. mean, I went to film school because I wasn't really good at math all and right. you know, all of that. So all right. yeah, it was very much an entrepreneurial effort. All right, my next introduction is for Tanya Hawk. And she is an actress. She's a producer. She is known for uh, Wicked Offer. Crown, uh, that's a 2015 film. Crowning Jewels, 2017. And of course, Kid Brother, which she co-starred with one of my uh, television co-stars, Alan Longstreet. The most rewarding thing about working in Michigan? I think the most rewarding thing about working in Michigan really is the fact that there's really an unlimited amount of resources here. I mean, we have the most amazing you know, geography here. Mm -hmm. We have everything you could possibly want to shoot under the sun. Um, there's so many talented and wonderful people here that are, you know, truly committed to their craft. And, you know, everyone here is, that's at least in film that I know, is really committed mm -hmm. to continuing their art and continuing to, you know, keep putting Michigan on the map. Yeah. No, no matter how the laws or incentives may change, there's a dedicated group of people here making films. Yeah, Absolutely. we really we're here <laughs> with the best technology and some very creative. And also uh, to to the next panelist, uh, Salim Girmay. She is the strategic partner promotions manager for the Michigan Film and Digital Media Office. The office is doing some new things. How is it different than say ten years ago? Um, our office used to be known as the Michigan Film, Film Office, office um, and it rebranded to Michigan Film and Digital Media um, in honor of the fact that we were broadening our scope about a year and a half to two years ago. Um, that was the first step that we took uh, when incentives were eliminated in July of uh, 2015, and we're really excited about the steps we've made since then to, um, in terms of our new mission, which mm -hmm. is all about um, positioning Michigan as a great place for creatives to live, work, and play. Mm. 
And we don't view creatives as um, solely artists. What we're working on doing is reframing the artist as the entrepreneur. Okay. So our office is housed within the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Oh. Um, so there are business development programs, community development programs, really? absolutely, that serve automotive industry or agricultural. What we are doing is reframing the conversation to focus on a broader scope. Mm -hmm. So when we say creative, we mean not only film, but music, digital, architecture, design. And we want to, again, aggregate the resources to reframe that, the artists as the entrepreneur. Love it. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot more today, but I have more panelists to introduce. Next is Steve Byrne. He's the arts and entertainment editor and director of the Detroit uh, Free Press. He's the executive director of the Free Film Festival as well. And we've talked about the festival more than a few times. So real quickly, uh, talk about, I, I love your festival and I love what you're doing. Talk about the Freep's commitment to showcasing art and artists here in Michigan, especially with your film festival. Yeah, sure. So we started the film festival, or the idea for it came about about five and a half, six years ago. Um, there were a couple reasons we wanted to do it. One was there were a lot of people coming into town making films either about Detroit or in Detroit, and we didn't really see anybody corralling that and putting them all in together in one spot. If you think about like searching for Sugar Man, Detropia, yeah. um, a lot of films that were making big national news that too, were man. that were set here, and the Free Press also has an Emmy winning Emmy award winning video team, and we were like, this could be an opportunity not only to, you know, step out in that space where films are getting made, but also have another way to show off our stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and over, you know, we're now heading into our fifth year. The festival has grown and grown. I feel like, um, if you don't know, it's documentary focused. So. Mm -hmm. um, we view it as part of the Free Press's journalistic mission. Documentaries are really close to journalism, and uh, we love supporting uh, the people around town who are making films. I would say at least half, if not three quarters of our film, have strong local connections, whether it's the subject or the people who are making the film. You had that, that great Riot documentary that you guys put out this yeah. past year. Fact, that was, was 12th in Claremont. Man. That was a fantastic piece of work, so thank you. All right, uh, to our final panelists, it is uh, Sam Logan Galegi. He's an Emmy-nominated producer known for the feature-length art house drama Approaching Midnight in 2013. It was a hit in the film festival circuit, having been initially acquired by Lionsgate Home Entertainment. But Sam, we have to talk for a minute because you have a new film that you've been working on that I was on the set of. We're really excited because I've got a lot of the people out here that you know, worked really hard on the film. The film has worked very closely with local law enforcement mm -hmm. and is uh, Kaiba Films, a freshman effort yeah. that we've partnered up on to, uh, to, to create the new film division of Kaiba, and, uh, you know, which uh, Telga Nation has, has, has done a wonderful job of uh, assembling. Uh, well, I did ask you a question specifically, uh, Sam. You've always been dedicated to here. You could go anywhere and make films. What, what made you stay here and keeps you here? I mean, aside from family and, and the familiar, familial territory, you know, some of the things that were mentioned, uh, the aesthetic landscape of Michigan is just yeah. enormously beautiful. From, all that was shot here? Yeah, all of it was shot 100. There is one single frame of the movie that it was something very important that was in Atlanta, and we had to get it. Uh, not a single frame. It's, it's, a, it's a single scene, really. But, <laughs> but it's... Uh, but everything else was completely Detroit. 99.5% 99 was in Detroit. <laughs> but... But uh, we were really excited about the geography over the course of the last few years. You know, um, you know, we've been—I've been elated to be involved with so many fantastic talent that, mm -hmm. that exists here locally. Also, how great everybody is about doing everything. You know, we were talking about, you know, economy. You know, it's—it's it's fantastic. One of the, the proudest moments that I think Tell has, or our executive producer out there, is when he gets to cut checks and pay people. Um, <laughs> and just also, also some of the amazing people that, that in the community that help us do it. Mm -hmm. Nowhere else could we close down roads. So th special thanks to the Village of Lake Orion and Orion Township for letting us shut it down. Yeah. You just can't do that in Beverly Hills, yeah. you know, not, yeah. not without paying you know, an arm and a leg. So. All right. All right. Thanks. So uh, let's get into the, the conversation and talk about not only filmmaking, but entrepreneur efforts when it comes to filmmaking. Because to me, uh, when you start to make a film, it is true, a truly entrepreneurial effort all the way through from getting the right actors to getting the right places to getting the right financing to taking that and getting the right distribution if it's not already in place. It's a true 
uh, labor of love as an entrepreneur and filmmaker. So in what way uh, is filmmaking the process truly, in, in your eyes, an, an entrepreneur effort? And do you agree that it's an entrepreneurial effort, first of all? And I'll let you take that one first, Sam. Um, definitely in our part. I mean, obviously we, you know, I was just talking to Steve, uh, inviting him to come by and see the office, you know, because that's one of those things you, you're like, come and see our production office. <laughs> it exists, you know, because in Michigan everyone's, how, how many people call you, Lee? I made a movie. I have yep. a movie idea. Yeah, a uh, lot. So, you know, to, to make it into a tangible product and then take that tangible product and being able to turn it into a commercial product so that you can continue to make, mm -hmm. you know, films that are, you know, both emotionally, you know, relevant to, to the filmmaker and to the auteur himself, but also mm -hmm. you want to you have an audience. Um, being able to find that audience is entirely an effort, no different than someone who might you know, open up a, a cookie store mm -hmm. or a dry cleaners or, you know, want to manage their own uh, technology firm. You are, you are, you know, spearheading a, a, a particular idea and trying to make it alive in, in the physical world so that your audience will look at you and go, wow, that's, that's, that's fantastic. So that you have these brands mm -hmm. that you recognize as th those are filmmakers that I know or, and, and those are film titles that I know or those are production companies and distributors that I know. So to, to, to take it from, con you know, inception mm -hmm. and then taking it all the way to that yeah. last step, again, it's no different than any other business. Any so. other business. Now, speaking of business, a, a huge part of the filmmaking business now is truly, to me, technology. It changes everything. There was a movie that was shot. Uh, Tiny Furniture, I think, is the name of it. It was shot on an iPhone, and she also took it to a festival. And she, you're nodding your head, Steve. You know what I'm talking about. And she ended up making a show called Girls that's on HBO. And now she's a well-known filmmaker, but she shot uh, her first movie uh, on a device that we all can carry uh, in our pockets. So it's really changing the way you have to look at filmmaking and technology has changed the business. And, and Salam, I'll let you take this one because you changed the office knowing that this is the future. And how can it not only uh, talk about how that is, not only the future, it's now, but how Michigan is, is trying to react to that and make sure we're part of all the different platforms that media can play on. Absolutely. So the, um, our new approach is, again, focusing on talent, whereas before we were focused on tr attracting the one-off project, we want to now attract and retain the talent that make the project. When you say talent, what are you talking about? Producers? What do you, what do you tell me? Yeah, producers, directors, writers, crew. Um, and, and while in our sort of previous life the focus was on the larger major studios, mm -hmm. what the, the silver lining now is that we have um, a, sort of a renewed energy, energy around focusing on the home team and the homegrown talent. And there really is a market for uh, the original content that they're mm -hmm. producing. I mean, I'm sure um, a lot of us have heard in the news that uh, Netflix is going to be investing $2 billion more dollars this coming year in, in original content. They want to yeah. make their library 50% original content. So how can we... Um, empower and elevate uh, the creative entrepreneurs in Michigan and build those connections and build those pipelines to uh, to get Michigan content exported not only via platforms like Netflix and Amazon mm -hmm. but around the world through through other means and distribution as well uh, there, there used to be a huge incentive for them to come literally mm -hmm. Uh, what's in place now? A lot of people think there is nothing for a filmmaker financially when they come to Michigan. Is there anything in place? So there's nothing formally in place uh, in, in the same format that uh, incentives existed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a uh, state administered program via taxpayer dollars. So right. that program has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. What we're doing right now is developing a uh, grant program mm -hmm. Uh, it's been launched with five communities, Detroit being one of them. Um, it's $1.5 million spread across these five communities, and it's housed within the local um, business organization like a Chambers of Commerce. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's housed with the Downtown Detroit Partnership. That funding is meant to build infrastructure to, again, reframe the artist as the entrepreneur. Okay. So we're working um, not only with Downtown Detroit Partnership, but uh, public, private, nonprofit sector. We're also uh, building a board made of creatives to talk about what does it take to, um, again, help the creative entrepreneur um, work through the various change, uh, stages of their business and business development. 
Um, is that an immediate answer? Is that the instant gratification mm -hmm. of incentives? No, mm -hmm. but this is a three-year grant program and mm -hmm. we're really excited about how everyone is coming together to make suggestions. We're finding so many nonprofit mm -hmm. groups are doing great work in their own corner of, uh, of Detroit and yeah. don't even know what other organizations are doing. So how can we connect those dots to, again, elevate our creative entrepreneurs? Nice. Steve, have you seen... Uh uh, how would you rate the level of productions that you see? Because when you guys facilitate a festival, I know how many films you have to watch and how many different things you have to see, specifically when it comes to documentary films. Because, uh, and I say that because a lot of social media content is driven by the documentary style product. So I say to you, the level of the work that you're finding here, how is it? Yeah, um, we see a lot of great stuff that is made here. Um, mm -hmm. We also see a lot of stuff that is maybe people parachuting in and is right. made about us. I think it's a, it's right. a good mix. Um, you know, you talked about the way technology has changed so much, and you know, especially the last five years, it's really democratized the ability to make excellent films. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there's no way some of these movies that look like, say, as good as Sam's would. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying necessarily that you're on a lower budget, but you can make a really good looking film mm -hmm. with equipment that isn't as expensive as it would have been, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what we see when we're looking at the film festival, you know, last year we had, um, I think we had about 1,200 submissions. 1,200 submissions. Yeah, um, and a lot of them were from around the world and around the country, but mm -hmm. with a huge chunk of them made here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we certainly felt like we were able to build out a really good program. We had about 30, somewhere around 30 to 35 films, and I, I like to think that they were all good, um, yeah. or else we wouldn't have put them in there. Right, right. Uh, let's talk uh, about the process of filmmaking, converting a script, to producing and distributing a film and getting eyes on the product. And Rola, I want you to talk about this one because you made that happen from a small movie to a feature length film with uh, Detroit Unleaded. How do you make that happen? Um, so when I, when Detroit Unleaded was an idea, um, I created it into a short uh, script. So it was the first time I had ever written a script. You wrote the script yourself? Yeah, I wrote okay. the script myself. And again, I never thought I was a writer, I thought I was a director. <laughs> so then once I wrote, wrote the script, I, I began to get attention for the script. Nice. Uh, for my writing, basically. And um, I then, this was in 2004, so I then um, just kind of went back to my fundraising roots. I was always involved in nonprofit work, mm -hmm. and I was a telemarketer in college. Like, that's how I worked my way up, you know, through college. And so I kind of just went back to that and like really did a grassroots fundraising campaign way before Kickstarter. Um, I actually sent out actual letters <laughs> to people <laughs> asking them for donations to, I was raising $20,000. Um, and so, and then I also reached out to Arab American like famous actors mm -hmm. who, you know, pitched in like good chunks of money. And um, then I also really sacrificed. I moved out of my place, I moved back home with my family and all my paychecks were going to my project. And so really, I think at the core of making a film is sacrifice. You know, you have to sacrifice a lot of your time, your goals in life. Like my life goals were just out the window. It was all about this idea that I was obsessed with. How'd you make sure you had a high quality product? Because I get yeah. a lot of people who send me a link to their film mm -hmm. and the, the quality of the product, the way the movie shot. The technology is not the problem at all. It's the way the movie's shot and the way that it's written that makes a difference in a quality script and just another script. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you make sure you had quality uh, directing, f filming, and you make sure the quality was at a level that you thought was acceptable? You know, I wasn't really conscious of, I was just working as an artist. Mm -hmm. And so when you're working as an artist, as a writer and a director, you are committed to putting 100% of your heart and soul and blood and sweat and tears into the product. And so that was the only way for me to ensure that the quality of the product was going to be up there. I had no distractions. I quit my jobs. I, mm -hmm. raised, I raised enough money where I could do this full time and I remain doing this full time now. And I really dedicated all my mm -hmm. thinking constantly for years around the characters, around uh, the script. I rewrote the script probably 11 times. I had 11 drafts of the script. I brought on board two writers at the end to help mm -hmm. me get it up there. Mm -hmm. So every time I hit a roadblock, I would bring in experts. But while, while the experts, while I was working by myself, it was, a, it was the time in my life where I spent the most amount of time alone. 
like really, truly, truly alone. Because I knew that the story had to come from me, and so I had to spend time getting to know myself so that I, I could actually direct people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's really about dedicating really 100% of your time to this craft and to the story and being upset. I was completely obsessed with my characters. And when people watch my film, that's the biggest compliment I receive is that they feel like the characters were greatly loved and they were very realistic and they really loved the performances. And so I feel like when you put in 100%, your actors, your crew, your story like gives you back 100%. Uh, let, let's go to Tanya, Kid, making Kid Brother, which turned out very well. Um, talk about the, the process of making it and how did the, the, what, the two gentlemen uh, responsible for the, the film get all those things in place? And as a producer and an, and an actor yourself, how was it for a Michigan independent film? Well, um, the process. I, can, I mean, the process. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I mean, I think with any film, you know, it all starts with the script. Like, real to sudden, you know, you really have to love your characters and and love the sto and put together a story that uh, people can relate to across, you know, many levels. And um, when I came to the project, I actually was hired as a lead actress first. Mm -hmm. And so uh, during filming, it became apparent that you know. They, they just needed a little more help and they and I said well I'm producing <laughs> so we ended up um, just deciding to work together completely collaboratively and so we filmed here all in Detroit pretty much um, I think we just did like some bar scenes that were a little ways away like out in Livonia but we really filmed almost still every metro Detroit yeah metro Detroit I mean it's it's hundred percent filmed here in Detroit so um, you know and that was really important to the to the brothers, um, I worked with Devin and Bryce Cameron. They are the writers and director producers of the film as well. Um, so, you know, it was really important to them to keep that that vibe of the film, but also to keep it homegrown and also to you know make it a really collaborative effort. I mean, everybody in the film played a role. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really all hands on deck. I mean, yeah. and, and that's kind of the way it has to be in indie filmmaking because you know you're working on limited resources like. Um, twenty thousand dollars you know that's about it and um, you know when you do that it becomes a family and it becomes you know really important for all of you everyone involved to to put together that um, extra effort and and to really push through and, and to see it finished to see it through the finish line yeah. so now we're in the process of um, pre premieres and and uh, pursuing distribution so good uh, I hand the mic to a man who is uh, racing toward the finish line. It's Sam right here. <laughs> your, your film is in the process of being made right now. Um, it is. But talk about... We're shooting right now next door. Yeah. Talk, talk about does Michigan, in your opinion, have the resources it needs to make a top quality film on par with anything else? And, and how do you make that happen? Let's back up one second, though. Tell people what Kaiba is, first okay. of all, because it's a brand new thing, and you guys are based here, and you're doing your thing here. Right. Talk about okay. that. So my company, SLK Media Group, we, you know, I, I was introduced um, a few years back by uh, one of our executive producers, G.B. Timotheos, who had introduced me to uh, Telga Nation. We had lunch. We chatted. We had lunch. We chatted. Things didn't really happen. Mm -hmm. Then I said something about wanting to make a film, and, and, and Kaiba is a, uh, a renowned IT communications company, of course, Loads of awards from Cranes, you know, and uh, all the other publications. And this past year, you know, our media, you know, myself and my company w were, were awarded, and we had met up again and chatted a little bit. And luckily, we we, we had a few, you know, good ideas kind of stirring around, and, and we found that there might be a place for both of us to come together. We created the physical division of Kaiba Films based off of so KaibaFilms.com. You know, that's where you guys can go. K Y Y B A. Mm -hmm. K you got to spell it really carefully because you could Google the wrong thing. So, K Y Y B A Films dot com, um, uh, and uh, to to follow up on the the other question you were asking more about, does do we have the resources? Um, I, I want to answer that, but I also want to give a, another answer to something else that you didn't ask. But I think someone out there is going to be think is is thinking it, and yeah, no correct. one's really saying it mm -hmm. necessarily to them uh, uh, at a lot of these panels. Uh, the first part, yes, I, I think we definitely have the resources. We're somewhat fragmented, you know. You know, you've got fantastic filmmakers like Rola and Tanya, and you know, you you've got fantastic individuals like yourself that work hard to make sure that you know. I've seen some of the space you've given, you know, some of these filmmakers, Lee, and I, you, we had a chat, you know, I think 
10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, you know, I was, I was an intern for Paramount Pictures. And Lee actually would like to sit and talk to me. You know, I was working three jobs, washing dishes, going through grad school after that. And, you know, I, I mean, it, it, but when, when you, the thing about Michigan is people actually care for one another. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles or New York, if I was in downtown, if I was in Manhattan running around after like the, you probably couldn't get that time and space with an individual like Steve and, you know, we're all here today. So we do have the resources that, you know, the, the, the hope is that we can glue them together because sometimes there's fantastic people out there. I, I got Bobby Lane and one of our lead actors is out there today. He walked into our audition room. I had never met this guy in my life. He walked in looking like, you know, like a younger Clint Eastwood. I was like, yeah, we're going to cast him. I'm not even going to like look at anybody else. But the fantastic thing was he was doing stunts on Real Steel and, and, and Red Dawn and all these other he bigger pictures that were in town. Nice. So but, but we just didn't have an opportunity to, there's no like film club, you know, there's no like Michigan. I mean, th there, there's fragmented organizations and groups, but the resources are there, the geography, as you said, is there, the aesthetics are there, the beauty is there. I, but I want to just touch on one thing real quick, because I think I get a lot of questions from filmmakers, and they always feel like filmmakers are being somewhat cryptic. And so I, I want to say this again, there's no difference. You know, when I did my first short film, you know, it was, it was horrendous. You know, you know, I was just playing with a camera. But one of the things I learned after that is, you know, if, if you want to turn it into a business, I think, what is it, like 50 bucks? Start an LLC in the state of Michigan. You know, establish yeah. your LLC, find your partners, you and your best friend, you and your mother, you and your father, you and your uncles, you and your cousins. Put it together, it's no different than, again, any other local shop. Create that, create a, open a bank account. Start with like 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 2,000 bucks. Go out and buy camera equipment, write it off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, all a it's all tax deductible. Um, you know, be able to do all those things that a normal business person would do. You might not have all the money in the world to get, you know, your grade A lawyers and accountants, but it starts somewhere. And somewhere out there right now, there's an 18-year-old, 17-year-old getting out of high school that was kind of like me, like, oh, shucks, I really hope somebody would just give me a chance. Go out there and do it for yourself, man. Go take those little necessary steps. Again, you know, start your own little company. Start your Michigan LLC. Start making your films around here because you know the geography here. Connect with your friends. Connect with everyone around you. Because in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the films that I was inspired by, you know, the zoetrope days, you know, when you think of Lu you know, Lucas and Coppola and Spielberg and Walter Murch and all these editors, you know, and all the guys out in San Francisco and, and, and the Bay Area and L.A. and the USC and UCLA crowd, we, they're, they're, it's, I don't delineate that from what's happening here. We just have to get ourselves together. But there are some fantastic young people out there. And even if, there, if your film's a little messy and it doesn't make sense, it's okay. Listen, you don't have to win the Crying Monkey Award at some coveted Eastern European Film Festival or, you know, uh, get to Sundance. So long as you are happy with what you did and you learned from it and you had fun doing it and you keep yourself open to continuing to learn because you have to be able to learn. Like, the hard part is when someone makes, you know, a bad film and is like, no, it was great. <laughs> you know, I can tell you right now, for anyone that goes to Walmart.com or Best Buy and, you know, I had a few people that told me, hey, I went to Walmart.com and I bought your movie. I bought your DVD. I was like, thanks, I'll get 10 cents. But I said, if you want your 17.99 back, let me know. I'll just, I'm so sorry. Every, you know, I, I have to admit when, listen, there's been a few mistakes. If I could go back and make changes, we would. But we're all learning, and that's, I think, what we have to also do. So the, the young film, filmmakers out there, you know, lear, make mistakes so that you can learn from them and be open to learning from them and then discover who you are and you'll find your own individual voice. You have a Lebanese filmmaker here who has a very strong personality. We had a conversation yesterday. We didn't necessarily agree on things, but that personality is what makes you an awesome auteur. Tanya, an awesome auteur. Steve, a fantastic journalist. Yourself as well and all the things you've gone through. So there's no delineation from the filmmakers that are out there. Find your own personal voice and tell those stories. And you know what? There's people out there that'll help you get them out. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about once you get the movie made. No, I'm sticking with you, Sam, for a second. Once you get the movie made, how do you get distribution? Because the, the model of having a successful film is very different to me nowadays. And it's truly, uh, it's truly an entrepreneurial effort. Meaning, you could make a movie here that makes a lot of money in another country right. and does very well in another country before you bring it back here. And th there's a lot That's of different true. ways to make a movie happen. So talk about, for people who don't understand, once the movie's made, talk about it getting picked up for okay. festivals, picked up in distribution, and how that works toward the success and bigger success of a film. And, and, and I think Rola and, and, and Tanya can probably answer on this too. We've had different experiences probably going about it, but somewhat mm -hmm. similar. Um, Hustle. 
it's okay. There's a very thin line between persistence and petulance. All right. It's but ride it. Ride that it's, line. It is a thin line. You're right. Well, you know, you probably. Can I send you an email? Do I, can you give me your real email address, not the fake one? You know, it's it's like talking to a girl in a bar, right? You just have to get the guts and go out and do it. You might not have an agent, you know, uh, but you got to do it. So it's it's it's. But that's how the distributors are. I mean, listen. I would have never thought. I grew up on Second and Forest off Woodward, right in Cass Quarter, the old Cass. And I'm not talking about the new one that's mm -hmm. really cool, has coffee shops and all. <laughs> I'm talking the old one. I'm, you know, hey Ma, she remembers out there. She knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Hardworking woman. Grew up as a, you know, in, in, you know, I mean, in an absolute. Listen, I grew up in absolute poverty in Detroit, but mm -hmm. that's what that's what I absorbed, and that's what I fell in love with, and that's what I wanted to try to. That's what helped me get to the point I am today, which is what kind of says, okay. I'm not signed to CAA or William Morris or, or you, you know UTA or let's say you do because I know a few people who do get there, but that person, that agent, I'm still at the bottom of the ground. They're not still making that call. You know, we decided we wanted to four wall, and I became very good friends with a really good, fantastic man, Paul Glantz, CEO of Imagine Theaters. Paul and I connected. We had, but we had hope, luckily a, a relationship that was somewhat established th th in another way. And you know, I said, listen, you know, I got down on one knee. I said, Paul. <laughs> Would you marry us? Would you, would you seriously come and help us? Help? You know, I presented him options and I said, we'll put the financial part back into your hands so that you're not risking anything by not showing, you know, the next Avengers or Marvel film or DC picture that might, the big superhero, you know, big the rom-com. But you have to have something to offer. You have to also make sure that you're not being, that's when I said, petulance, don't, don't tell that person who can give you that presentation or that exhibition or that distribution that you've made the next Gone with the Wind or you know the next mm -hmm. David Lean picture. You know, don't really it, it, think to yourself, what is it that you've put together? How can you help this person benefit from it, from it? And how can you ask them to help you at the same time? And that's kind of what we did with the acquisitions directors that we went to. We, we, we crafted it very particularly, you know, the, 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 the message, the strategy. What kind of films? I, learn who the distributors are. Go to, I, 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 to all the f young filmmakers, again. And define distributor for the okay, young filmmaker. I, because I want them to know what I'm referring to. Today, if you're, if you're 18, 19, 20, you're going to Specs, you're going to you know, U of M film school, you're going to Northwestern, go Wildcats. Um, you know, if, if, if you're out there, go to your local you know, bookstore or, 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 or shop that might sell DVDs. Look at the back of those DVDs. Besides, there's not just 20th Century Fox, not just Warner Brothers and, and Relativity and some of the big companies that are out there. Um, and the Lions Gates and the Monterey Medias. Thank you, Scott Mansfield, for taking a risk of, with on us. Um, but we look at those distributors and and, and, I, and identify who they are. Start reading on about them and who, who because there's a lot of people in the second and third tier that are pretty big distributors that you will have seen pictures from, but you wouldn't have thought, you know, in pop culture. You, you're not thinking in the front of your, you know, the, that your brain who that distributor is, but you've seen their logo. That person might really like horror films. That acquisitions director might really, really like romantic comedies. That person might really like films that have um, a personal twist that has to do with the story of immigrants or the story of, you know, um, it, two guys just hanging out in Michigan. <laughs> you know, if, if you, you know, a Midwest story. If you can do your do your due diligence and, and study the way you would if you were taking the ACTs or SATs. Don't just make a film and just go, yeah, you know, we're taking it to Universal. You know, we're taking a film. They're coming to it. You know, a right. lot of people kind of say right. that, and it's like they're not right. going to come to you. You have to go to them. And you can't just call the 1-800 number. <laughs> you, know, <Right. laughs> you know, you have, to ident you have to go to the events, go to the activities, find out who people are, learn who they are. Because you never know who might be sitting in this audience today who might be, you know, someone who you, it's not famous, but they happen to be the acquisitions director or one of many acquisitions directors, content you know, providers you know, from Netflix or Hulu or you know, there's a lot of social media uh, outlets now. And, and, and don't, don't say no too quick when, when you're first starting. You know, I, I know a lot of people, also young filmmakers out there, you hold on to things. Don't hold on to it too long because technology changes so yeah, fast. Again, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to keep mumbling on here. I, I do want to let everybody else get a chance at this. But I wanted to just address a couple things because I always feel that filmmakers aren't told those little things. It's it, and that's how I did it. You know, listen, I was, I would literally, I would read the back of every DVD cover in every mm -hmm. store and find out who every production company is. Google them. You know, Yahoo them. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. You got to do your due yeah. diligence. Yes. Do your homework and find you out who those done. people are. And you can get it done. Um, uh, Let's talk to Rolla for a second, and of course, Tanya, you can you can chime in as well. Uh, do you think that um, 
maybe partnering with international or partnering with someone will it would help you to produce more product here or or especially specifically in Michigan to grow uh, as an artist and be featured as as an artist here in Michigan maybe a better question is what do you think the right route is what is the right approach in looking into the future for filmmakers who want to stay here make films here and prosper um i mean I think that there's so many different, I mean, if you talk to any filmmaker, successful, famous, you know, or on the way up, there's so many different roads to success and so many definitions mm -hmm. of success. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely partnering up with people and somebody who, like, for me, it's vital that I work with producers. Um, because as my ideas grow and as my films grew, I could no longer produce, direct, and write. I, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I'm ready to drop the producing, which I have, and have teamed up with executive producers and producers. And, and back up a little bit because mm -hmm. these are terms that are broad. In television producing is one thing, in sure. film producing is one thing, and in film producing is another thing. Sure. So define what you mean by executive producer and producer. Yeah. So an executive producer is the person that secures all the money and the financing and takes care of the investors. Um, the producer is the is really the is a person that puts everything together that hires the entire crew. Sometimes, like for me, I'm an executive producer and I'm a director writer. So I uh, I like to be part of getting you know investors on board, and then I don't produce and then I write and direct. So I ensure that I have enough of a budget to hire the right producers that I want, and then I'm free to write and direct, which is really necessary if you want to grow as a writer director. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's vital, it's key to growing as a, as a filmmaker, especially growing as an artist, that you have to let go of the producing so that you can really take off and fly as a director and your ideas can really flourish that way. Oh, so really yeah, it, it is key to, to partner. We have three minutes left, so maybe keep your answers a little shorter, but I want to jump to this one real quick. Uh, is, are there things in place to help people navigate their way through that kind of process yet? Um, so what, where we're at right now is again um, connecting the dots with the various organizations and groups that are dedicating their time and work towards creative, so nonprofit, private, and public sector. Um, in terms of uh, navigating the execution of your production, what yeah. we do Helping have... Helping an entrepreneur navigate that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. What we do have in place today is a partnership with the mayor's office. It's called the Detroit Film Initiative. Step one is... Is that new? Uh, it, it's fairly new. Um, okay. It's actually what helped us land Comedy Central Detroiters. Oh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a cool show. To yeah. the city, yes. Yeah. So their, their pilot was incented, and they called us a few months later, like, the suits loved it. Mm -hmm. We're greenlit for season one. Nice. Um, where's that incentives application? And the, the program had been eliminated. So we said, hold the phone. <laughs> Let us call our friends in, in Detroit in the mayor's office yeah. and develop an enticement package to bring you here. We knew that Detroit has those natural assets. Um, we knew that you can stretch your, fur, your dollar further in the Midwest than you mm -hmm. can in New York or California. Yeah. The two lead um, actors are from, from the are. area, so that definitely yeah. helped us. So we worked with the mayor's office to make the city more film friendly nice. um, and essentially help them with permitting, closing down the roads, all of these things that make it easier to do the business of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Part two that we're working on right now is building a roster of businesses, traditional businesses, that are probably represented in the room today that are going to be willing to offset production costs. Okay. Is it going to be to the degree of something that would attract a paramount? Right. Probably not, but it will help the independent filmmakers. So that's, we're in the middle of building that roster of filmmakers. We did a webinar with Cranes, or I'm sorry, with entrepreneurs with traditional businesses like mm -hmm. caterers, hotels, yeah. all of those things to say, for a slice of this film business, are right. you willing to wheel and deal? All right. Uh, well, since we only have a couple of minutes left, I want to go down the line and start with Steve and, and just talk about if there's something you want people to, to know about that you're working on. Is there something new coming or maybe the next festival? And the same thing, does anyone have a product that they'd like to talk about or a movie that they'd like to talk about upcoming events, Steve? Um, sure, I'll say three things fast. Uh, Free Film Festival's next edition is April 11th through 15, 2018. Uh, we're starting to take submissions, so nice. if people have films, pl please let us know. Um, Lee talked about distribution. We're working real hard to get national distribution for 12th and Claremont, which is the great, 67 great movie yeah. that he talked about.
about. Hopefully, we're going to be having some serious talks about that next week. Good, good. And um, last, I'll mention, I am also, outside of my free presses stuff, working on a documentary film myself. Nice. Um, so um, doing that hustle thing that everybody <laughs> is referencing up here, just it's a passion project good, and um, not getting paid for it or anything like that's, that. That's just where go. it starts. That's where it starts. Tanya. Um, well, I have uh, two projects currently, one in production, one in development. Um, that I'm, so I'm working on a documentary too. Um, I've just, uh, the last six months or so, I've sort of picked up the producer role for a filmmaking team that's been working on a documentary about the Women's March in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. okay. So it was really exciting. We were part of the convention Good. just um, the other weekend. So mm -hmm. that was really exciting and we're just keeping it moving forward. Um, that's happening and then I have a feature film that I've been working on the script for since like November and we're just about out of development. So we're going to start into pre-production very soon. All right, Sam, can you hand Sam, Sam, Sam the mic? Either one Well, uh, I mentioned Approaching Midnight earlier is, uh, is out on DVD, iTunes, major retailers. Uh, Animus, The Telltale Heart, one of our other pictures from the screenwriter of Devil's Night, uh, has acquired distribution in the German-speaking region of Europe and nice. Brazil. And uh, the DVD is, I think, now also coming out via Redbox and, uh, and Netflix. Um, uh, and Devil's Night, Dawn of the Name Rouge, uh, which is our uh, uh, Kaiba film freshman effort, um, which is our new production company here in Detroit. We're going to be here to stay. Uh, we've got four brick walls and a roof on uh, Orchard Lake Road in 13 miles. So, nice. um, yeah, so we're excited about that, and we'll keep an eye out next spring. Uh, okay, two, so two quick things. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Creative Chamber program in Detroit, whether you're a creative looking to figure out what that toolbox, how that toolbox is shaping up, or want to be a part of focus grouping to help us build that toolbox, it is on our website. You could Google Michigan Creative Chamber. Mm -hmm. On that uh, site, there will be a link where you can include, uh, list your email address, and that's how you can um, stay in touch for future outreach. Uh, the second comment is mm -hmm. just a word of advice that to not limit yourself to only thinking about using your creative for uh, entertainment purposes um, in filmmaking, but also think about the uh, businesses, the nonprofits that also need to tell their stories to market yes. their products. Agreed. That's the way you can hone your craft, but also um, make a livelihood. Absolutely, and I'll pile on that before Rolla speaks. Uh, Detroit and Michigan used to be number two in production behind Los Angeles because of the automotive industry and industrial films. There are some great technical talent here. There's great things to be done, and social media is exploding. Everyone wants to tell their story. So if you start thinking of just storytelling rather than films, it could change the way you do business. Go ahead, Rolla. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to invite everybody here to check out my feature film called Detroit Unleaded. You can just Google it or go to DetroitUnleaded.com. It is considered the very first Arab American film. Um, and I'm working on my next project, which mm -hmm. maybe will be the second Arab American film if <laughs> nobody else releases another film. Um, <laughs> and it's called Nadia's House, and it's about four Lebanese girls trying to get married. So it's a little rom com slash coming of age. All right, and uh, a shot here in Michigan. Uh, and for me, I have a show on Fox 2 called Critically Speaking. I review movies from the top to small, smaller independents across the board. It airs Friday at 6.30, Saturday at 9.30 a.m. It'll be on tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. And also you can catch me on Fox 2 on Thursdays and Fridays. So thank you for everybody in the audience here in attendance for listening and everybody via the cameras that are in place for watching. And we will continue to always support films, filmmakers, and great companies that are staying in the great state of Michigan. So thanks everyone for their time.